Hello, everyone, and, and welcome. My name is Joe Saramelli. I oversee Grand Rounds for the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And, and thanks for joining today's presentation. Uh, a, a couple of things about this year's Grand Round series. Uh, we're trying to have uh, many of the presentations uh, re relate to a theme called Next Steps in Care. Um, and uh, we do have a Grand Rounds core team uh, that works on Grand Rounds each week, uh, which includes Samhara Braha on communications and coordination and Mike Walker on technology. We re-record our presentations and they're archived on the Grand Rounds website, which is on the Department of Psychiatry uh, website. Uh, Want to acknowledge several sources of funding for the series, the Ripley Fund and the Garvey Institute for Brain Health Solutions. And close to the end of the presentation, I'll put a link in the chat box um, that's a link to a five question Grand Rounds evaluation. We, we do this every, uh, with every presentation. It's helpful for me with organizing Grand Rounds and with communicating with the uh, presenters afterwards. You're also welcome to just write to me anytime uh, directly about Grand Rounds. Um, during the course of the presentation, you could type in questions or comments in the chat or the Q&A, and I could go through those at the end uh, with, with Dr. Grabowski. And I'll, I'll stop for there and turn it over to Dr. Unitzer. Thank you, Joe. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome, everybody, uh, to today's Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Grand Rounds. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Tom Grabowski, and I'll say a few things about Tom before I turn it over to him. Uh, Tom trained in medicine and neurology uh, at UW and at the Mass General, uh, and then he did a fellowship in behavioral neurology and cognitive neurosciences uh, at the University of Iowa. He joined the faculty here at UW as a professor. Uh, he's a professor in the departments of radiology and neurology, and he came uh, back here in 2009. Uh, and his research uh, uses state-of-the-art neuroimaging methods to examine how the brain is organized, how it functions to support language and cognition in health and in disease. Uh, uh, Tom is a really Wonderful person. He's a gifted clinician and teacher. He directs the UW Memory and Brain Wellness Center at Harborview. Uh, and that's a really, I think, a, a wonderful exemplary program that includes a team of clinicians and researchers from several departments, including our own department. Uh, Tom also directs the NIH supported Alzheimer's Disease Research Center here at UW and the Integrated Brain Imaging Center. Uh, and he, I think, provides really great leadership for uh, UW's work in the area of cognitive aging. He's a terrific role model and mentor for many of our clinician scientists, and he's also a really wonderful friend and colleague. Uh, today, Tom's going to share with us some of his work and his wisdom on tracking preclinical Alzheimer's disease with biomarkers. So let me uh, uh, please join me in welcoming Tom Grabowski to Psychiatry in Behavioral Sciences Grand Rounds. Great, thank um, you. Yes. All yours. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Jurgen, for that generous introduction. Let me share my screen here. And hopefully you are now seeing my screen. Yes. Great. All right. Well, it's really a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Um, and I want to start by acknowledging the Garvey Institute and uh, specifically for energizing so many of us uh, around its ambitious mission, you know, to have a population level impact on prevention of neuropsychiatric disease for a variety of conditions across the lifespan. Uh, one of the focus areas is cognitive aging and brain health. Um, and I want to uh, really square up to uh, discussing how our ADFC can facilitate the study of cognitive aging, uh, the phenomenon of resilience in cognitive aging and preclinical neurodegenerative disease. Uh, and this really takes us, uh, as you'll see, to an intersection of behavior and biology. Um, I also want to acknowledge there's a lot of expertise in this department, and I'm hoping for, for discussion. So maybe I should start by talking about normal cognitive aging, or as, um, uh, as an alternative term, adult cognitive development, um, as uh, all of us know, some of the leaders in this field are in the Department of Psychiatry here. Uh, and I'm showing here a, a diagram from one of Warner Shias' papers in which he was trying to succinctly 
um, summarize uh, some aspects of adult cognitive development. And the, the term development is used uh, uh, because, you know, in fact, depending on the domain, um, you know, there's a trajectory of, uh, of development. And I'm leaving aside here personality factors, but just thinking about intellectual or psycho psychometric abilities, um, they're, you know, in a, in a sort of typical or central tendency of the trajectory of, of cognitive development, there will be, there will be gains you know, in, in, in early adulthood, plateauing or asymptoting and then plateauing uh, with mild declines happening in later years. And uh, in some cases like um, aspects that we might think of in the classic terms of, of um, crystallized intelligence versus um, performance or, or performance IQ, uh, fluid intelligence, um, you know, the, there are some factors which continue to gain even, you know, even well through midlife. Um, and it uh, isn't always a matter of uh, decline. Um, there are some individuals who are particularly successful agers who may show minimal decline. These are the George Martins and uh, Marcus Rakels of the world uh, that, 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 show intellectual vigor and productivity uh, matching their their you know their physical lifespan uh, and there are others who are less successful agers and may develop a mild degree of cognitive impairment or may even cross the threshold the functional threshold to dementia in later years and uh, you know what is going on with that is really one of the important questions that I want to think about today and uh, as I alluded to earlier, we're going to need to talk a little bit about the biology. So first, let's um, kind of orient around a simple, simple diagram here. I lifted this from a recent review article. Um, and you can think of the black curve as sort of modeled on uh, Warner's sort of typical or normal cognitive aging curve. Although I apologize that it crosses the, the dementia threshold because it doesn't really do that for for. Uh, people typically, unless you count terminal decline. Um, but that trajectory, which does involve decline um, relative to one's baseline, can be um, affected by factors good and bad. So you can be dragged to the left here by brain insults like Alzheimer's disease, like vascular brain injury, like traumatic brain injury, uh, and other medical conditions. Uh, and you can be pushed to the right by factors like education and cognitive habits and regular exercise and social connectedness that conspire to um, preserve uh, function longer. Um, and we've been talking about under the rubrics of resistance and resilience to degenerative disease. And we'll talk more about those as we go here. Um, the trajectory of cognitive aging is matched by a trajectory of adult brain development. So instead of adult cognitive development, we'll talk about adult brain development. And uh, many of you know from, because this is just super classic work by Paul Yakovlev that you know, the brain is not fully mature uh, in childhood. Um, myelination of the brain is, is ongoing. There's a, a gradient from, uh, uh, sensory and motor regions to association areas in the sense that the, 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 the association areas are myelinating later. And, you know, the, the, the um, great commissures and the sort of long range cortical cortical connections are still myelinating up into the second and third decade. What we've learned uh, more recently using more sophisticated approaches like um, MRI imaging is that the intracortical myelination is still maturing beyond that. Here's a, from a recent paper showing that the myelin content of uh, superior frontal region is still changing up into the 40s. Um, and uh, in contrast, the trajectory of gray matter is down from your 20s on, you know, there's cortical thinning cortical thinning, pruning, if you will, this is part of normal brain development uh, and the overall pattern of brain thinning or, or gray matter um, decline, if you will, uh, is sort of summarized in this lower right-hand 
figure from one of Chell's papers, uh, and this is you know, very, this is sort of matches what's phylogenetically recent, but doesn't really match all that well what degenerates in Alzheimer's disease. So that's, those are all, that's sort of all normal phenomena. And in a functional terms, there's also uh, a trajectory through the lifespan. And this is um, a paper from Olaf Sporn's group, which I thought told a story brief enough to put in the presentation here today, but the resting state networks uh, functional connectivity networks that we can identify with fMRI um, show a systematic changes with aging, at least at the group level, where there's a, a, a tendency for a decline in the coherence of the connectivity within a functional network and more cross connectivity between networks. And you can think of this as less differentiation, less segregation of function with age. Uh, and that's, uh, that's apparently normal. So adult cognitive development is matched by, uh, in, or sort of underla underlain by uh, adult brain development. And similarly, memory loss and dementia are gonna be, have a, the counterpart as a cerebral degeneration. And reserve and resilience that we'll talk about uh, probably has a, a physiologic basis. And uh, all this raises some practical measurement issues in research. You know, how do you detect degenerative processes before function declines? How do you measure brain health in general? What is the brain health status of participants in my specific research study? And these are some of the things that, that we, uh, we would like to provide resources for in the ADRC. So with that sort of overture, I would like to organize the rest of the talk around three areas. One is um, biological definition and biomarker detection of Alzheimer's disease. The second being the, uh, around this phenomenon of, of resilience to Alzheimer's disease. And third, uh, what are some of the research resources that we're putting in place for preclinical Alzheimer's disease here at UW? So there is Dr. Alzheimer himself. Um, and uh, I'd say, this point is one everybody probably not, probably now learns in high school that the uh, microscopic hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease are uh, amyloid plaques, which are extracellular and composed largely of amyloid beta 1 to 42 with a neuritic uh, surround uh, and neurofibrillary tangles, which are intracellular accumulations of hyperphosphorylated tau protein in a paired helical filament conformation. So those plaques and tangles um, are, are the hallmarks. They, they don't occur everywhere evenly and they do, at least the, the tangles uh, sort of unfold in a fairly stereotypical spatial pattern that's been captured in the rubric of Brock staging. So there are, there are early Brock stages where, where the tangles are mainly in medial temporal lobe structures. Uh, intermediate Brock stages where they've spread into uh, the limbic system more generally and the adjacent areas in the, in the ventral frontal and, and in temporal lobe. And then widespread isocortical involvement in Brock stages five and six that still relatively spare the early sensory motor regions. And those uh, transneuronal limbic and isocortical stages roughly map onto the three sort of clinical stages of disease. So it takes widespread neocortical involvement in general to produce dementia. The intermediate stages correspond to uh, the leading sort of amnestic mild cognitive impairment stage, which may last about five years or so. Uh, and then before that, Brock stages one and two, largely asymptomatic, uh, truly asymptomatic uh, and lasting around 15 years, or if you believe recent papers, maybe that amyloid accumulation is happening for 20, 30 years. Um, and so, excuse me, um, that's sort of a pair, of that, that sort of um, canonical staging. So when we talk about plaques and tangles, I think there are three levels of significance for the discussion. First, they are the defining hallmarks of the disease. Basically, you could call this plaque and tangle disease. It's a little bit circular. Um, you know, Alzheimer's, it is Alzheimer's disease if there's degeneration with plaques and tangles and and, and, um, and symptoms, right? Um, but we also employ 
uh, amyloid and tau protein as biomarkers of the disease. And I'll concentrate a lot on that here. Uh, and the third level of significance would be, are these, are these actually involved in the, the mechanisms that drive the disease? Are they, are they, are they, um, are they pivotal, pivotal aspects of the pathophysiology? And I'm not gonna talk that much about that today. That's, I think, uh, a deeper topic. Um, and when we talk about biomarkers, of course, we're talking about things you can measure uh, in biological media uh, that have to do with disease. And they fall into different categories. You can talk about biomarkers which are useful for diagnosis. And I'll concentrate on that today. Um, also, uh, biomarkers that are useful for, for uh, uh, detecting progression or measuring progression of disease and uh, those which are useful for identifying specific mechanisms of disease. I think uh, we're, we're, uh, make, we've made a lot of progress on diagnostic biomarkers and making good progress on progression markers. The mechanistic markers, again, is a topic for, for more, for probably for a different talk. So in terms of diagnostic Alzheimer's disease biomarkers, uh, we're, we're talking mainly about the pathologic amyloid species and the pathologic tau species. So amyloid precursor protein is uh, the native protein. What it's doing and why it's a, regularly, a regular product of synaptic processing is still uh, uncertain. Uh, and it is cleaved into different fragments. Uh, the, the one to 42 fragment is the amyloidogenic component. Um, and so we're generally measuring AB42 or its ratio sort of normalized against AB40 in spinal fluid or blood plasma as the biomarker. We can also measure amyloid uptake uh, in the brain using uh, specific PET tracers. And I'll show you what those images look like shortly. Similarly, uh, there are uh, pathologic forms of tau protein. These are phosphorylated at different sites. Tau biology is complex. Uh, there's quite a few sites that do get phosphorylated. Most of the work has been done with site 181 and more recently 217. Uh, there's also phosphorylation at 231. These three phosphorylation sites seems to behave similarly as uh, in, in terms of biomarkers. Uh, these are testable in spinal fluid or blood plasma. Um, and then there are also PET tracers, which are uh, avid for paired helical filament tau confirmation and, uh, and are useful. So um, this is just a, a I'm, I'm showing this slide for two reasons. Uh, uh, this is work that summarizes kinetic modeling work that's been done with amyloid species by Don Albert and colleagues at Randy Bateman's group. <coughs> Um, Don Albert is going to be joining us as a new colleague at the University of Washington. Um, he, uh, he's done some of the best work on, uh, on modeling the kinetics and the flux of amyloid uh, through uh, different mechanisms. And uh, one of the things that happens is you know, amyloid beta species are cleared uh, by you know, uh, transported across blood-brain barrier by proteolysis by incorporation into plaques and through spinal fluid mechanisms. And the, the, the spinal fluid mechanism gets more and more important as you age because the blood-brain barrier transport and the proteolysis fall off. Um, and because AB42 is being kind of sunk into the plaques, it actually is in lower concentration in the spinal fluid. So the pathologic direction for spinal fluid measures of AB42 is depressed, is low, um, as opposed to tau protein, which will be high. Uh, this is what an amyloid PET scan looks like. Um, in the green box are, are negative scans and the red boxes are positive scans. Uh, there's non-specific uptake of tau uh, tracer into the white matter. So you see a white matter skeleton uh, if you squint a little bit in the left-hand boxes, but uh, do you get this ground glass appearance that effaces the gray-white junction uh, in the positive scans? And you can kind of see how you kind of lose that inner hemispheric fissure gray matter in the frontal lobes, for example. So that's what a positive amyloid PET scan looks like. Um, amyloid scans are 
already pretty maximally abnormal by the time people present with mild cognitive impairment. The amyloid has been accumulating for years prior to that point, and you can measure accumulation, as I'll show shortly. But, but by the time diagnosis is at stake, uh, this is usually not a close call. Um, and, uh, and there's not much regional, regionally important information in the scan. In other words, uh, if the, the pattern of amyloid deposition isn't, isn't uh, reflected in the clinical presentation. It's very unlike tau scanning, which bears a really tight relationship to the clinical presentation. Uh, and if you have a positive amyloid PET scan, that signifies you have moderately dense neuritic plaques, uh, according to some specific criteria articulated by the CRAD consortium. Um, amyloid uh, uh, scans in asymptomatic individuals will show varying levels of amyloid, of course. Um, serial scans will show accumulation of amyloid in those who already have amyloid. Uh, as kind of depicted here in the upper left spaghetti plot. Um, it's interesting, this has been now reported by two or three groups, that if you align these trajectories on the onset of uptake, you actually get a pretty strikingly linear um, accumulation. And people in the field are starting to talk about an amyloid age, you know, as it, you can actually tell how many years someone has been accumulating amyloid based on their um, uptake ratios in their amyloid scans. Um, and in those aligned data, you can see that the um, tau scan findings also become pretty systematically aligned uh, too. And you can see that the, um, the, the increases in tau are happening sort of, you know, systematically later than the uptake of amyloid tracer. So, uh, that's, you know, in broad agreement with this uh, sort of canonical sequence of Alzheimer's disease biomarkers that's been, this, this or some version of this diagram has shown it like every other Alzheimer's disease talk these days. Um, yeah, showing that across the sort of syndromic disease span here from a latent or presymptomatic stage through mild cognitive impairment or dementia, how often are biomarkers abnormal? And in this preclinical yellow box here, the thing which is reliably abnormal is the amyloid measurement, either from spinal fluid, which is actually the earliest change, or, or on, the, uh, on the amyloid PET scan. And then, and then it's tau, and then it's neurodegeneration. So um, these amyloid and tau biomarkers um, that now are pretty sensitive and can be used to objectively define the presence of disease process um, have been sort of formally rolled into a, a research diagnostic framework. It's not a clinical diagnostic framework, it's a research framework uh, that you know, has been evolving over the last five years or so. Um, and this is called the ATN framework, A for amyloid, T for tau, N for neurodegeneration. Um, so it's, you know, ideally you have a binary decision, A plus or minus, T plus or minus, N plus or minus, based on uh, markers of those specific features. So if you follow amyloid from a spinal fluid or PET measurement, or let's just say also blood plasma, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, tau from one of those modalities as well, a neurodegeneration from usually from MRI or from metabolic PET, but also you could index degeneration by a, by a spinal fluid or blood marker like neurofilament light or total tau. Um, and in principle, everybody in a, an aging or AD related study could be classified on this ATN uh, framework. And basically if you are A positive, there's, you know, there's eight possibilities, but if you're one of the four A positive possibilities, um, then, then by this research framework, you're on the Alzheimer disease continuum. Um, if, if there's also a positive tau marker, then we would say Alzheimer's disease full stop. And if you'll notice, I haven't said anything about cognition yet. Um, so this is a radically biological definition of Alzheimer's disease. And there's no contradiction in saying 
mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease, if you've got that biomarker to confirm it, or, or, or Alzheimer's disease contributing to mild cognitive impairment, which might be the more appropriate way to look at it. Um, and then if, if the amyloid marker is negative, of course, you're in a non-Alzheimer regime. So the advantages of ATN are that it defines things biologically, specific biological states targetable by interventions. You know, if there's an aspect of Alzheimer's disease or a version of Alzheimer's disease not marked by amyloid and tau, of course, we're going to miss it with this. But, but as I said at the beginning, that's the way we define Alzheimer's disease to begin with. Um, maybe more to the point, ATN really operationalizes the preclinical AD. There's no other way, I think, to approach that. Um, and I think that makes a big difference. Um, so here I'm showing um, two curves. The red curve is the rate of Alzheimer's disease dementia in, the, in a clinical sample, um, you know, which gets going, you know, it's age 60 or 65 and doubles every five year epoch after that. The blue curve is the rate of amyloid PET scan positivity in the unselected older population, which lags, but is parallel. It lags 15 years, but is parallel to the red curve. And if you look at the age 70 time point, for example, that comes out to 25% amyloid positive. And remember I said that means um, moderately dense amyloid plaques. And that really means you know, quite a few years of amyloid accumulation have been happening already. And in fact, you know, what, what is going on here is um, a much higher rate of amyloid positivity and preclinical disease than is reflected in dementia. And all the statistics you hear about around Alzheimer's disease, you know, 5.8 million cases in the United States or whatever, you know, that's the, that's the part of the iceberg that's above water. Nobody's really talking in those facts and figures about mild cognitive impairment or not much, maybe, maybe more so lately. But, but, but uh, the, the mild cognitive impairment in preclinical stages are really the, the under the water part of the iceberg. And conservatively, there's two or three cases, preclinical cases for every clinically manifest case. So the, the, the magnitude of this problem is very significant. Um, and while I'm still talking about biomarkers, I thought I would just mention for uh, some of the plasma work, since I've, I've brought this up once or twice, so um, the best work here has been done by, um, by Randy Bateman's group at Washington University in St. Louis. And these are data that were published by Suzanne Schindler and his group in 2019. Um, uh, and basically this is cross-validation of plasma amyloid against amyloid PET scanning. And you, know, you can see there's pretty good separation. There's about a 15% on average reduction in a B4240 ratio, and you can get an area under the curve here on, on an ROC analysis of a 0.88, which is pretty good. Um, when they factor in age and APOE status, they actually get uh, a little better discrimination. And uh, one thing that they've pointed out here is that the, uh, when you follow over time, a lot of these pet negative individuals actually convert their PET scan to positive. So one of the factors underlying the discrepancy here in some cases is the, the, uh, uh, the uh, plasma and spinal fluid measurements for that matter are more sensitive measures of amyloidosis than the brain scan is. Here's what the counterpart looks like for spinal fluid where you get a 45% reduction in amyloid beta 42 and or 42 40 ratio rather and an area under curve of 0.98. So, um, you know, the CSF test is better. It's the better test, but uh, it requires a lumbar puncture. Uh, and that's not sort of globally accepted or always possible. Um, so this uh, plasma test is now available. You can send out and do this. Uh, I have a colleague in the clinic who has sent out a couple of these um, C2 diagnostics at Washington St. Louis, and this will run you $1,100. Um, I don't know. I don't think it's covered currently, um, but it is in a CLIA environment and is a clinically investable, invest, uh, clinically available test. Um, 
tau species are also being measured in, in, in plasma. And I think a lot of us have been pleasantly surprised that these tau measurements are so good. They're, you know, they're actually performing better than the amyloid, uh, plasma amyloid measures. Uh, you know, to bring the plasma amyloid measures up to the same level of performance, you have to factor in APOE and age, as I mentioned, but um, these tau measures are looking pretty good. And the interesting thing is that they're correlating with both uh, brain amyloid and brain tau. Um, and this is a recent paper that's informed a lot of thinking about this uh, by a pretty stellar group of investigators. And this is about 20, 217 p-tau, but 181 p-tau, the feeling is it probably would be pretty similar. Uh, but 217 p-tau seems, seems especially specific for Alzheimer's disease. But, it's, but uh, when you look at an autopsy cohort, the, the uh, amount of plaques and tangles are, are, are both independently predictive of the p-tau level and the best model incorporates both. Uh, and in early disease, it really looks like it's tracking um, amounts of plaques and in later disease amounts of tangles. And uh, I guess on reflection, it doesn't really surprise me because I, as I pointed out earlier, you know, those, those neuritic plaques are combined lesions. They are surrounded by, by a, a neuritic surround and that means there are all sorts of dystrophic neurites that are, that are laden with phospho tau. Um, and so the, the, you know, the, the process of Alzheimer's is really a, um, you know, something's generating both species. Um, one thing that this paper contributed is this mediation analysis that says that 77% of, um, of the variability in tangle density uh, was uh, predicted. I mean, the, the relationship between plaque density and tangle density was mediated by the plasma tau value. So I thought that was an interesting thing. And they confirmed this in a second arm of the study that was done with uh, living individuals using the tau and amyloid PET scans instead of autopsy measures. And again, about 66% of the variance was explained by, by the mediation analysis. So 217p tau is looking like a pretty good blood test uh, that's pretty sensitive to both amyloid and tau accumulation in the brain. And a lot of pharmaceutical companies are starting to use this test as they're screened for entry into the clinical trial. So some take home points here, um, Alzheimer's disease is latent in the brain in, in an important number of older people for at least 15 years prior to cognitive impairment. And the only practical way to separate this preclinical latent stage disease from typical brain aging is with biomarkers. Um, this preclinical period is really an opportunity to delay even prevent Alzheimer's disease. And plasma markers are now being used in research and are coming soon, I'd say, to clinical work. So let me turn to talk a little bit now about detecting and measuring resilience to Alzheimer's disease. And, and um, this is something that, that we talk a lot about in the Alzheimer's Disease Center because we see cases at uh, autopsy and, and, and we talk around uh, at our monthly CPC where there's a high burden of plaques and tangles, but the last time the person was uh, was evaluated, which might have only been a year or two earlier, they didn't have any cognitive impairment or important cognitive impairment. Um, so here's, for example, the experience of the ACT study at UW. Uh, this is work that Aaron Volz published in 2019 um, of 276 ACT autopsies. So these are in a community sample uh, who had Brock stage three or worse. 25% uh, of them had no dementia and were classified as resilient. And compared to the 208 that did have dementia, these resilient individuals had higher rates or higher levels of education and lower rates of brain comorbidity. It shouldn't be too surprising, but the, 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 um, these factors, this sort of goes back to my earlier diagram. Um, you know, there's good guys and bad guys. There's factors that, that make you resilient and there's factors that drag you back, right? Um, uh, here's uh, some data from the other population-based study of dementia risk that's been going on as long as ACT, and that's the one at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. These are data that Priyanki Muvamuri published in 2014. Um, and in their experience, they were looking at um, 
two factors. They were looking at education and occupational challenge. And they were looking at midlife and, and later life cognitive habits. In other words, did you spend at least three hours a week in cognitively demanding activity? And they had a way of operationalizing this. And they modeled a bunch of factors, but they basically um, found significant relationships for a combination of the education and occupational challenge. So that's one factor. And these mid and late life cognitive habits loaded on the second factor. And if you ask the question, you know, for an 80 year old uh, man or woman with normal memory today, but an APOE4 carriage, how many years on average until Alzheimer's disease will be manifest in that person clinically? Uh, and if you were low on education and low on cognitive habits, the average was two years. But if you were high on those two factors, you're out here at 10 years. In other words, you know, there's, there's almost a decade of difference in the tipping point, depending on these factors. And I thought this was pretty, pretty powerful piece of information. And basically shows you know this relationship of leaning in, leaning into the disease and 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 sort of um, illustrating this phenomenon of cognitive reserve or what we've been calling cognitive resilience here. Here's here's a pretty direct demonstration that this is a thing. Um, here are here's a pet study, a tau pet study. So what we have here are uh, um, a group of people with Alzheimer's disease with mild disease, so many mental state score on average is 25. And, and there's a median split by education uh, at about 15 years of education. So you have a high educated group and a low educated group equivalent, equivalent, equivalently impaired. Um, and if you contrast the high versus the low educated group, you see there's a lot of tau deposition in, a lot more tau deposition in the higher educated group. And if you look at, um, sort of Brock staging, at least as estimated by the tau PET scans, you can see the Brock 5 and Brock 6 high Brock stage group is overwhelmingly from the high educated group. So what you should take away from this, it takes a higher tau burden to drag the higher educated group into this equivalent level of dementia. So another way to think about that is um, um, some individuals uh, tolerate a higher burden of tau pathology for a given level of cognitive function. Uh, and that uh, is related in some way to educational level. So this relationship to Brock stage to degree of impairment that I talked about earlier actually isn't, that's a canonical thing, but it actually sort of behaves more like this, where you, know, you can have a high Brock stage and less impairment if some of these uh, lifestyle engagement factors are, are, are important. Uh, and you can be dragged back uh, by comorbidity like cerebrovascular disease and manifest uh, Alzheimer's disease, if you will, at a low Brock stage. Um, and the other reason this is all so important is because all this sounds like, like, you know, the relationship, the quantitative relationship between cognitive and behavioral impairment to degree of Alzheimer's pathology seems modifiable, seems malleable. Um, and, you know, th th here's just uh, this, I think, has been a re really uh, important recent study, the FINGER study, the Finnish Geriatric Intervention Study, in which, in which you know, sort of did an omnibus intervention. You know, they, they did cognitive training and exercise, but they also uh, tried to improve health through diet and vascular risk monitoring. Um, in, a, in a fairly sizable cohort of Finnish seniors, Finnish seniors who were selected to be at average or low average levels on cognition and to have a high dementia risk based on cardiovascular factors primarily. Um, but the, though it's a randomized trial and the intervention group is showing um, um, uh, you know, statistically significant separation from the control group at two years on the total cognitive score on an executive functioning measure and on processing speed, although not on, on memory per se. But you're seeing evidence that a multi-domain intervention can improve or maintain cognitive functioning in at-risk elderly. So, so I'd say this phenomenon of, of resilience is something that is clinically super important. Um, and, uh, you know, with, there's, these are realistic degrees of intervention yeah, 
And um, it's an important axis of variability that's there in the aging population. I dare say that that it's not it's it's lurking there in clinical trials, right? It's got to be an important factor, um, but it's not being modeled. And it's uh, I would argue that that's almost as an important uh, deal in the long run as whether or not someone with dementia has an Alzheimer biomarker or not. Um, so I think important clue to therapeutics, important. Uh, phenomenon overall. And we, as I mentioned, we have been talking about this in terms of um, the terms resistance, meaning you, know, you don't have the pathology of Alzheimer's disease despite the risk. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about today, but it's that that's a thing too. But uh, resilience, which means you have mild or no cognitive impairment despite the pathologic load. And that um, has been talked about under the rubric, cognitive reserve, cognitive resilience, functional resilience. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's uh, well, because I've been talking about, you know, there's this push-pull, there's, there's good guys and bad guys. It's, it's, you know, when you're observing cognition and its relationship to degeneration and age um, without, biomarkers, you know, you don't know whether you're looking at how much of what, what you're looking at is um, is reserve and resilience and how much you, of what you're looking at is comorbidity comor or absence of comorbidity. Um, so that's an important thing. Um, here's a slide that sort of makes that point. So in the same ACT study, uh, Caitlin Latimer led this, but, um, and a lot of us were involved, but looking at very carefully selected autopsies and matching them, and so in looking at people that were apparently resilient or apparently resistant to Alzheimer's disease and what their comorbidities were, um, you can see, just concentrate on the right half here, in the resilient and matched um, AD dementia cases, you can see that the, what struck us as a big difference here is the red component, which is the co-pathology with the TDP43 proteinopathy and you know, here's here's a third proteinopathy that is playing an important role in Alzheimer's disease uh, that we don't have a biomarker for, um, and have only recently appreciated how important its role is here. Um, so it just goes to show that that it, that resilience is maybe not all about lifestyle factors. There's also there's there's also how much or little comorbidity is going on. Um, there's been a recent um, kind of NIH-funded um, educational grant to uh, convene some meetings to uh, more carefully define cognitive reserve and resilience for, for standardization for research purposes. Um, this is the definition that, that that collaboratory gives of reserve, a property of the brain that allows for cognitive performance that's better than expected given the degree of life course related brain changes in brain injury or disease. Um, and I think that's helpful in the sense that, you know, resilience doesn't only mean that you don't have any cognitive impairment despite a brain load of Alzheimer changes. It means you, you beat expectations. It means you have better performance than, than, than you should have on average based on, on, on what the population is doing. And that leads us to an, yeah, a way to actually operationalize this in the clinic. Um, so you can measure um, this by having some uh, solid measure of brain change or burden of disease, and, and then some measure of cognitive change or cognitive impairment. And then by regressing one on the other and adjusting for age, you can you can ask, you know, where, where's the, what's the residual look like? What's the residual of that regression? And if you're if you're falling, you know, if you're if your residual is falling way above the curve, then you're an individual operationally with high reserve or high resilience. And if you're below the curve, then that's an, a vulnerable individual. And when we did this, use this sort of residual method for uh, oh, 250 participants or so from our memory and brain wellness center, you can see that residual is correlating quite nicely with years of education, even with a really crude approach using the MOCA score as the, as the cognitive measure. 
So, um, so this residual method sort of offers a way to generate uh, uh, an estimate, if you will, of if an individual's resi resilience, we'll call it the R marker. So we're starting to talk about ATN and R uh, and making a systematic effort to characterize this in the, in the ADRC sample. Um, I ran across this paper quite recently um, that uh, really nicely showed uh, how you might approach um, uh, looking for the substrate of cognitive reserve. So this is by, uh, led by Goggin Wig, uh, psychologist who's at University of Dallas in the Center for Vital Longevity there. I'm sure Sherry knows Goggin. Um, so this is imaging work that was done at Washington University in St. Louis where Goggin trained 265 cognitively normal individuals that were split by whether or not they had a college education and he's looking at resting state functional networks, the same networks that we always talk about, default network, attentional networks, et cetera. And graphically, you can see here a um, network diagram that shows uh, that, you know, there's some segregation of these uh, nodes of these different systems from each other that uh, either uh, gets less segregated or stays segregated. Okay, so remember I said earlier, over the trajectory of cognitive aging, there's a tendency for networks to become less differentiated and in, by, in work by another group. And this is the same phenomenon here. And if you look at these spaghetti plots showing, you know, a measure that summarizes this degree of segregation, you can see the low, um, ed lower educated group showing more decline with time. Uh, this decline is statistically significant. This decline predicts uh, cognitive impairment, or not cognitive impairment, but it predicts functional impairment as measured by um, CDR sum of the boxes uh, in subsequent three or four years. So here's a, a sort of large scale physiologic construct this network segregation that's showing correlation with uh, risk in um, in the normal cognition individuals. So, and then just to, to kind of make an, a related point, data from that same study, here's a problem with doing this educational split like Goggin did in the study. Um, these groups are systematically different in their um, socioeconomic economic index, in the, the, neighbor, the neighborhood median household income, in their area uh, disadvantage, it's a, I think that's called dis, dis, deprivation index. Um, social determinants of health are correlated with education, are also of course correlated with um, uh, under rep, membership in an underrepresented group. And so, and so we have, um, again, the same worry that there's some um, uh, in clarity in terms of what you're attributing these phenomena to. So it would be really nice if this work could, could be done systematically with biomarkers, um, which can at least uh, speak to what is the actual burden of pathology in the participants. And the um, problem is that this kind of systematic biomarker characterization is expensive and hard to scale. PET imaging is very expensive. CSF measures depend on spinal taps, which are not well accepted, especially by maybe, maybe, maybe disproportionately by certain subject groups, like we find our American Indian participants are not enthusiastic about this. Um, and these factors conspire to impede inclusion of many subject groups. Uh, this results not just in underrepresentation of some at risk groups, but underrepresentation of the low resilience individuals that we're trying to study. And so this is just directly scientifically counterproductive. Um, so, so, so let me just summarize this section on resilience. Um, these lifestyle factors can make years of difference in the tipping point. Um, the resilience to AD as a function of lifestyle factors, though, suggests the course of AD is modifiable. Uh, as I said, this must be a major source of unmodeled variance in clinical trials. Uh, and these resilience and effects of comorbidity are hard to separate uh, as social determinants of health are correlated with, with health challenges. So 
Uh, these are some of the challenges we're up against in trying to, to move to up our game in looking at resilience in the living participants in the center. So thinking about research resources now for preclinical AD at UW, let me just point out, there's like a billion really interesting questions to ask here. You know, are, can you really build the brain stronger or are we just avoiding comorbidity? Can resilience be built after symptoms begin? Nobody really knows that for sure. How much does failing to take resilience into account impede clinical trials? Would building reserve in concert with disease modifying therapy more, be more effective? Uh, are interventions designed to build reserve likely to be more effective for under advantaged groups? How do we estimate resilience? Etc. So to do this, we're really going to have to have um, some way to um, characterize participants better systematically, um, and uh, you know, in the ADRC, you know, we take the tack of you know rich measures of brain structure and function, um, degenerative markers. We talked about uh, marking resilience, um, but how do you scale this up? Um, you may really need more accessible and less expensive ways to achieve the characterization and perhaps validate it in the well-characterized participants. So I'll just tell you about a couple things that we're trying to do. Um, you know, our centerpiece of our Alzheimer's Center is this observational or longitudinal cohort that we pool with uh, the other Alzheimer's centers in the, in the national network. These are characterized to national standards, uh, but each ADRC's cohort has its own character too. Um, as sort of mentioned that we're in, trying to systematically characterize ATN status. We're taking standard imaging in essentially uh, all participants who are uh, up through mild dementia and trying to estimate resilience now. Um, uh, you know, local studies interested in resilience to Alzheimer's disease can leverage our approaches and even our participants. And I would encourage you to talk to us about that. Um, we have recently put in place a Quanterix platform that will let us measure plasma biomarkers um, in-house. Um, we will probably send parallel samples to the National uh, so, uh, Centralized Repository for Alzheimer's Disease too but we're thinking of 181 PTAU and NFL being made available, uh, not just being made available, but being used systematically in our observational cohort and especially in our underrepresented groups. Um, and the incremental cost is about $60 a test. So it's really pretty affordable. Um, so that's the game plan. Uh, we have begun to use a um, kind of radically different form of MRI. Um, so this is called synthetic MRI. Uh, the sequence is a, goes by this inscrutable name of 3D qualis. But basically this is a relaxometry sequence that, that, that directly measures the underlying physical parameters to determine MRI contrast. You know, you, you're used to hearing about a T1 weighted image or a T2 weighted image, but these measures, you know, estimate absolute T1, absolute T2 and proton density uh, and allow you in six minutes to acquire all this information perfectly co-registered with isotropic one millimeter resolution. Um, so it's, here's an example of a 3D qualis output. Here's T1, T2, and proton density, absolutely. And here's where this individual sits on a total myelin, brain myelin curve against a normal database. You can see how this is like, like you know, halfway there to our R measure right here. Here's somebody who's got a normal amount of white matter, but if she were down here, uh, you know, we would say there's you know, that much evidence of degeneration happening. Here's a, another individual. Uh, here's the gray, what the, the way the normal gray matter curve looks, looks. I told you it's all decline. So it's basically decline from age 20. Um, and he's got, uh, he's sort of beating expectations. So he's someone with, we would say brain reserve. Uh, so a fast scan, um, absolute quantitation, great because it's scanner platform independent. We don't need to worry about the ways different vendors weight T1, for example. A great way to harmonize data across uh, centers uh, and uh, maybe even better coming soon for FDA approval and might get available in the clinic. Um, other things we're working on, some 
Uh, I think maybe I'll skip over this, but to say that they're, that we're really trying to uh, pilot some of these uh, easier, so less burdensome uh, acquisition approaches in clinical patients under a um, project funded by the Wild Neural Hub. So our take-home points, um, you know, if 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 you have a local study and you're interested in resilience, you can leverage ADRC approaches and participants. This would probably be especially helpful to take advantage of the imaging character the characterization we can provide. Um, I think the plasma biomarkers are going to be popular. Um, and this idea of estimating resilience systematically and building a resilience cohort is a new direction for us. And we welcome input and collaboration on that. So just, uh, just to like a slide on the clinic here, you know, in 1990, this is where we were typically encountering a patient when there was dementia and we had only symptomatic medication. In 2020, in the Memory and Brain Wellness Center, we're typically encountering people at mild stages of disease and, you know, fully 25% of our clientele is mild cognitive impairment. And we're talking a lot about building resilience through the mechanisms we've been talking about, leveraging retained strengths, uh, making the community more friendly uh, and, and trying to remove stigma on the diagnosis to encourage early diagnosis. But where we want to be in 2030 is, you know, we're sort of on the cusp of a radically different model because really this has to move into primary care. And really we need to need biomarkers to detect problems in the preclinical epoch. And, you know, we're expecting there is going to be disease modifying medication. I'd say, you know, we've kind of shot across the bow with aducanumab. Um, I personally think um, that aducanumab uh, is more likely to be effective than, than the popular opinion. And I'm basing that on, on what the plasma P tau biomarkers are showing. Um, but we'll see. But something is coming to, to, to make it consequential to know in the preclinical era what your amyloid and tau status is. So I, I think these are all highly relevant points uh, for clinical care in the future. So with that, I'm gonna stop, ask for questions, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Grabowski. Uh, what a notable, remarkable presentation of, of the progress here, uh, the scope of research and, the, and its immediate clinical effects. You, you've um, managed to answer many questions, even without knowing, or maybe without knowing it or knowing it, uh, that have come up, including commenting on aducanumab uh, right at the end. <laughs> it's, you touched on many points. Um, one, one question, uh, I mean, you mentioned about uh, a, a latency of Alzheimer's disease in the brain for about 15 years uh, prior to cognitive impairment. What, what, what impact, if any, does brain injury have on that latency? Does it decrease the latency? Um, for example, does it have no effect? Well, I mean, I don't know how well that's been directly studied, but I would, I would say, I imagine, I would imagine that, um, you know, when you have comorbidity like that, 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 um, you're going to present earlier with cognitive impairment. So in general, the more, the more, uh, the more disease entities that are ganging up, uh, and, you know, we see this a lot with comorbid, comorbid, small vessel vascular disease and Alzheimer's disease, for example, but Lewy body changes are also pretty common player. Um, TDP43, as I mentioned, although we can't, it's sort of like the dark matter, we can't really measure it in vivo yet. If you want, to, if you want a Nobel Prize, invent, invent a, 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 a marker for that one. Um, uh, and, you know, all, I, think, all, I think of them all the same way in terms of it's more, it's more hits on the system. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, uh... I, I appreciate your comments on that. There were, a, I, I, just with a minute or so left, maybe perhaps a couple of, of fast questions. One individual is interested in the, uh, to know if the normal physiologic function of TDP43 is understood, uh, or is that kind of is a newer development? It's a newer development. I don't think we know. It's a, it's a DNA binding protein, but what it's doing, I'm not. If someone knows, uh, 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 I don't know. Um, if someone knows, it's likely to be Caitlin Latimer. So send it to Caitlin. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then uh, here we are just at one o'clock, but someone's interested in how to participate in a, in a study. Uh, is there a, a website you might direct? Yeah, you can go just go to the ADR web 
ABRC website, there's a there's a there's a front desk number there you can call, um, yeah. and they'll. It's as simple as that. Or right. drop me an email. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, here we are, right at one o'clock. Uh, and Dr. Grabowski, I want to thank you again uh, for presenting in the Grand Round series. Thank you to the to all, all the attendees and participants for uh, uh, listening, for for writing in questions and comments. And we'll end Grand Rounds there for today. Thank you. Okay, and hopefully this is just the beginning of the discussion. Thank you very much.